Doing today's uh, introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the technical group manager for the radiological materials group in the nuclear sciences division at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the chair of the Generation 4 International Forum Education and Training Task Force. Patricia. Thank you so much, uh, Bertha. Good morning, everybody. I would like to um, introduce um, Dr. Mitchell Farmer. I don't know why this is off. Uh, I hope he's going to stop. I um, So Dr. Mitchell Farmer is... Oh, God. I don't know why there's an echo, Bertha. I'm so sorry. Do you have uh, um, two devices going, maybe your computer speakers and your and your phone? Yeah. One of those, uh, so what does they need to be muted? I'm far away from the computer. I moved out, so it should be better. Is it better? Yeah, it looks like. Yeah, I, I don't hear the echo. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Yes, so sorry. So, Dr. Michel Farmer is a senior nuclear engineer in the nuclear science and engineering division at Argonne National Lab. He has over 25 years of experience in various R&D areas related to reactor development, design, and safety. A principal career focus area has been light water reactor severe accident analysis and experiments. More recently, he has also been involved in the analysis, design, and conduct of experiments related to operations and safety of Gen 4 reactor concept, including sodium fast reactor, as well as high temperature gas cool reactors. He has over 200 publications in the above mentioned technical areas. Dr. Farmer also manages the light water reactor programs within Argonne's nuclear science and engineering division, in which these and other programs are carried out. Dr. Farmer received his bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from Purdue University, his master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Nebraska, and his PhD in nuclear engineering from the University of Illinois. I'm very happy to have you, Mitch, giving this webinar. Thank you again for volunteering, and I give you the floor. Thank you, Mitch. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pavier and, and Berta, for setting this up. And I have to say it's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, to talk about this topic. And I want to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who might be on the call, depending on your location. And it's, um, I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion on this topic, and I hope um, we can motivate some discussion at the end. Um, if I have control here. Okay. Well, I want to start the presentation by uh, giving you a little bit of motivation. And as we all recall, the reactor accidents at Fukushima and Diachi uh, reinforced the need for passive safety systems that will ensure safe shut shutdown of a nuclear reactor. Uh, there's two parts of um, writing out a postulated accident. The first is to get the reactor scrammed. Uh, but the second and uh, equally daunting from uh, thermal hydraulics uh, viewpoint is the long-term dissipation of decay heat. Uh, the plants at uh, Fukushima scrammed properly uh, the way they were intended to do, but the ensuing tsunami and uh, they came up and uh, engulfed basically the uh, uh, backup turbine generators that would provide the emergency cooling the equipment and run that uh, were um, rendered inoperable, and that uh, led to the sequence of events at Fukushima that was very um, troublesome in terms of terminating the accident. Uh, the, the BWR, ours there had Mark I containments. These are very nice plants, uh, but they do, they were designed in the 1960s and they rely heavily on active cooling systems uh, and they enable to, to be able to dissipate the decay heat. So that's, you know, an indication of why this work we're uh, working on here is important, and I just want to uh, reinforce that, that we, moving forward in advanced reactor systems, we need to do the best we can as engineers and scientists to come up with systems that can ride out these types of unforeseen events. This, this is just a follow-up, despite the, the, the fact that uh, the 
operators were there. They, the emergency power cooling systems were compromised. Um, the objective of this uh, plants moving forward would be to have fully passive systems that don't rely on active uh, equipment to operate electrical power. Uh, ideally, the, this equipment would always be on. It would require no human intervention uh, to activate. And basically, the, the bottom line is we're, if possible, come up with walk-away safety systems that, regardless of what happens, uh, the reactor can safely dissipate the decay heat without experiencing fuel damage and fission product release. So that's the goal. Uh, before I uh, move on any further, I want to say a few things about the overall goals of the work we've been working on, and, and I think to motivate some of that, it'd be good to um, reiterate some of the, the design, uh, uh, design and safety goals that were put forth uh, several years ago for the Generation 4 uh, project. And the first is that the system will uh, excel in safety and reliability, and that comes back to the passive aspect and uh, limit, limiting the amount of equipment that needs to be activated by humans. Uh, re reduced to a very low likelihood and degree uh, of extent of core damage that could occur during an accident. And finally, and this is uh, important and in reducing the overall cost and planning that is required to deploy a plan, and that's to eliminate the need for off-site emergency re response. Those are the high-level goals. Um, in, in terms of meeting those goals, the reactor cavity cooling system has emerged as a leading con concept to get there. Uh, this provides the ability to uh, inherently dissipate and passively dissipate decay heat to the uh, atmosphere. Uh, it offers a high degree of performance with uh, relative simplicity in the design. And uh, most important thing, this, these ideas are not new. They've been under uh, consideration for many years back when uh, reactor designers first started working on uh, development of concepts for plants. Um, and I, I want to stop right here and make one other statement. I, so the, the presentation I'm going to be making today is, is focused on the reactor cavity cooling system as a passive me method for dissipating decay heat. I want to note that there are other systems out there. Uh, one example of that is the uh, direct reactor auxiliary cooling system that's typically deployed in a lot of uh, sodium fast reactor plants where you would have a heat exchanger uh, located in either the hot or cold pools of, of the, the reactor uh, that would be plumbed to an air dump heat exchanger at an elevation quite a bit above the reactor uh, core itself. And in the event of an accident, there would be a magnetic latch or uh, the damper would fall open and you would naturally dissipate the d decay heat generated by the reactor by cooling to that type of a system. However, uh, that, that type of system has been heavily studied and I think uh, the industry has a good handle on that. And, and from the viewpoint of the work we've been doing here at Argonne, we really don't have anything to offer there in that area. So I'm just making the general statement that there are other ways to passively dissipate decay heat. But what I'm going to focus on in this presentation is that the, the work we've been doing uh, related to the reactor cavity cooling system. So I just want to make that clear um, to folks that are listening. Can't seem to uh, advance the view graph. Possibly you could do that for me. I've lost control. <laughs> I apologize, folks. Bear with me just a minute. Okay. There it goes. Okay. All right. Sorry about There's that. There's a really long delay, Mitch. I apologize for that. Oh, okay. All righty. No problem. Well, and I just, in, in, this, in general, I just like to make the comment that, you know, this, the, the RCCES is our focus, but ultimately this work that we're working on, I believe, is uh, valuable to the industry because it's uh, providing a pathway for uh, safe and reliable deployment of nuclear power moving forward. Uh, the work we've been doing here has uh, been carried out across a multi-institutional uh, effort that involved multiple national labs, industry, and also, uh, and very importantly, the universities. They've really provided a lot in this program, and I'll make a note on that as we move forward.
I've advanced it, but it just takes a second. Uh, before we get into the technical aspects, I just want to give you, uh, referring back to the previous view get group, group at, um, view grab, uh, a little bit about the scope and reach for this project. Again, we're working on developing an inherently safe uh, reactor cooling system, uh, simple design. Uh, the, con the concurrent approach we've taken is to involve a lot of universities and um, at different scales. What we're talking about here is the natural convection heat transfer process, and, and that's a nonlinear, uh, which involves a high degree of radiation heat transfer also. That's a very nonlinear heat transfer process, and thus you need to do tests at different scales to verify that the physics that you think you're seeing is actually uh, scalable. And to do that, we've had um, a variety of institutions involved here, uh, starting down at really uh, one eighth scale, one tenth scale, and the, in the scale of the tests that were done at the University of Michigan and uh, Texas A&M. The University of Wisconsin has also been involved in quarter scale tests. Uh, this, uh, where I have the pointer located, is just giving you an idea of the scale of the tests that we've been doing at Argonne. Uh, I would like to pan over here to the far left and just show you what the full plant design looks like. And, and the first system we're going to look at is a air-cooled uh, reactor cavity cooling system that's based on a general atomics um, modular high temperature gas reactor design. And that concept is shown to the far left on the bottom there. And basically you have five by, uh, five by 25 centimeter um, structural steel tubing that surrounds the uh, reactor silo itself. Uh, it's plumbed to exteriorly to air that's drawn into the building. At the top, these, uh, uh, the air, the, the heated air is discharged into uh, headers that take the uh, heated air out of the, out of the plant. This gives you an idea of the full scale design. Uh, we're doing half scale tests and basically we've taken about a 20 degree sector out of the um, overall concept and we're looking at 12 of these tubes in a scaled configuration. The tests that we have been, been doing at Argonne are, are more integral effects. Uh, they've done a lot of separate effects testing at the universities uh, with different methods and higher methods of uh, diagnostics to be able to provide the data we're looking for to qualify the system for reactor applications. So that's just an idea that this, uh, at least the air phase of this has been completed and, and it was done across the broad spectrum of facilities and uh, at different institutions. A little bit of an overview. As I noted, uh, the air-based system uh, relies on natural circulation and laminar turbulent flow regimes. Uh, it's a combination of radiation and convection heat transfer from the reactor vessel to a panel, air-cooled panels that draw air from the outside. It's heated. This is basically just a chimney, and then it's discharged here. Uh, this is a simple design. It can run all the time. Uh, and there's a a parasitic uh, heat loss that, while the system is running, but in any event, you do have to cool the reactor silo in just about any uh, design because of the heating in there. So this system serves that function, and then uh, in the event of a, a trip in the primary pumps or any any other uh, kind of a, um, a perturbation in the operating system, this system naturally is in operation uh, to dissipate the decay heat. Uh, this is a concept that's been pursued uh, not only in some of the U.S. designs, but internationally, and I've shown some of those there at different scales. Uh, the reactor scales themselves uh, range from uh, tens of megawatts up to around 600 megawatts for the General Atomics MHT GR design that we're going to uh, be talking about a little bit more in detail today. That's the air system. Then I hit the advanced button. Let's go ahead and start um, talking. I, eventually there would be a, a schematic that would come up here on the right hand side. Uh, we've used air in, in some of the tests. We're now embarking on a water-based system. Uh, water works just fine as a heat transfer medium also. Uh, in this case, the uh, recipient would be, of course, the water. There would be a header tank located up high in the plant elevation. Uh, the water during normal operations would be driven by a pump uh, rising through the reactor silo uh, and discharging into a, this header tank. 
that would uh, dissipate decay heat to a heat exchange unit. Uh, that would be the normal way of cooling the uh, reactor silo. However, in the event of an accident where there would be some kind of a transient, uh, that, that you would envision losing this heat sink here uh, and the ability to pump the water within the uh, water panel that cools the reactor silo. And in this case, the water would again rise by natural convection uh, and continue the cooling process. And the idea is can you develop sufficient natural convection uh, within the system coupled to the radiation and convection across the gap between the reactor vessel and the heating panel, a cooling panel, to discharge this. The nice thing about this system is that water has a very large heat capacity, and with a properly uh, sized header tank, you can uh, run this system for the design basis of 72 hours without the need to top off this tank uh, after you get into uh, boiling heat transfer and boil down to the, the uh, system here. So this is another system we're moving on currently to look at right now, and I'll come back and say a little bit more about that in the uh, presentation as we move forward. Okay. Uh, before we embarked on the air system, the first thing is you have to pick a system uh, that you want to look at and uh, base the design on some scaling, and that was done at the onset of this project. And, and again, we, we focused on the General Atomic MHTGR design, for which we had access to the, the facility de design itself, and also some of the de design basis access that they looked at as a part of the work. Uh, noting again that uh, the scaling we used in the argon test is basically half scale vertically. Uh, horizontally, working out from the reactor vessel, it's a one-to-one -one scaling in terms of the width of the, the silo and the um, hardware that we have placed in there as the air cooling panels. Uh, so that was also preserved. And if you go through that scaling, half scale, uh, and you want to decide you want to preserve the inlet and exit temperatures from the um, the riser uh, ducts during normal operations, then you come up with the fact that you need to do basically a square root of two times the uh, expected heat flux off the reactor vessel uh, during the transient and design your system accordingly. And that's what has been done, and you'll see, we'll reflect back on that. But the, the act, specific accident we have uh, uh, targeted a lot in our work, work is basically a depressurized conduction limited cool down transient, or you had some. A uh, relatively smaller leak that develops in the, in the uh, reactor system pressure vessel boundary uh, that discharges. And the heat transfer process is limited uh, by conduction, where you conduct heat from the core out to the, the um, radio reflector, and then that's dissipated across the uh, uh, gap in the, in, the, in the reactor cavity cooling system to these cooling jackets. So that's the uh, basis that we're going to be looking at in some of the results I'll present on this. but. Uh, when the, the reactor designers estimated that in this type of an accident, the peak uh, uh, reactor pressile, pressure vessel temperature would reach about 441 degrees C after about 120 hours. So based on the scaling that we've discussed here at a high level and the results I'll present uh, later, just trying to keep this uh, prediction in mind relative to where the uh, accident would go, this would be the peak temperature, then after that the uh, temperature would uh, decline by uh, gradual decay of the fission products in the core and the reduction in the overall decay heat load on the system. Okay, I've advanced. Sorry, folks, taking a minute here. I'll just reflect on some of the uh, information that we'll see on the next view graph. But uh, this type of work has been uh, ongoing at Argonne for uh, quite a few years. The, the uh, first uh, attempts at doing these types of uh, tests in an integral fashion were actually carried out in the 1980s when uh, the we were working on supporting uh, GE in the develop development of the reactor vessel auxiliary, auxiliary cooling system for RBAC design, which is basically a, a similar to the, based on the same physics that I described previously, 
but in that approach, the uh, air would be drawn into the uh, silo and basically just uh, just a large air draft cooling of the uh, reactor vessel and that plant design. Uh, the original work that was done, we put together about, I, well, I didn't personally, but I knew the folks who did, they put together about a 28-meter uh, tall test facility, uh, roughly half scale of the prism design, and there was testing done to look at that uh, to, to, ver to provide the data that was needed to um, move forward with that design from a licensing viewpoint. Uh, the, similar uh, to that, we reconstructed that facility to uh, include modern data acquisition and uh, a new, a completely new set of uh, instrumentation to be able to uh, provide better data for the, the current test moving forward. I'm not the data that was produced uh, in the previous test was exemplary; it was very high quality. But uh, the new, I will say that the new suite of codes that are being used in uh, the, the design of advanced reactor systems are much more higher fidelity, so there was a heavy focus on the redesign for this system to be able to provide higher quality data that could be used to qualify the uh, more uh, higher fidelity codes that are uh, being developed today. The other major thrust of the work that we've done is that uh, we, we really wanted to focus on providing information that could be applied directly to support licensing applications. And in the U.S., that means we have to follow NQA1 standards, which puts a high degree of rigor in terms of the experimental methods and documentation. So that program was invoked with the primary purpose of ensuring that the results that we produce could be used by a designer in supporting their um, uh, licensing process uh, with the data already accepted by the NRC, or, uh, and they've been involved in this process also to check basically that what the information we are providing is adequate in terms of meeting their requirements. Um, the top objectives of the NSTF program were basically to examine the paths of safety uh, for uh, future nuclear reactors, and as I pointed out, uh, provide a user facility to explore, I'll, or I'll make a point on this later, but when you start testing, you don't, you're never quite sure what's going to come up, and, and you'd and you like to have a facility that you can modify and to look at alternative uh, concepts to help to get you where you want to be. So that was a major uh, thrust of the facility we put together to make it flexible and uh, capable of being rearranged as needed uh, to look at different ideas. And as I mentioned, the third major point is that we wanted to generate a lot of high-quality data for code uh, verification and validation. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about that. I'm mostly a, an experimenter uh, in my background, but in parallel with this program, there, um, there was an analysis project where we systematically applied uh, codes to be able to qualify those to calculate these types of efforts. And there are other literature out there that can uh, be done on that. But basically, we use RELAP and START uh, CCM to look at these uh, test in detail and qualify these codes accordingly. And these were very supportive in, in helping us run the test and provide indications of where we needed to put instruments uh, to support the modeling. And as I pointed out, uh, this, this program was carried out at multiple scales at multiple universities looking at different separate effects types of uh, uh, work that was going on. And uh, one of the final things that we wanted to do was be able to develop a central data bank for the data that we produced that folks could access uh, in terms of qualifying their models uh, for application to reactor design. So that's uh, uh, where we're uh, at in terms of the, the goals for this project. Moving forward, the next few graphs uh, will come up here in a second, but basically it's just reemphasizing the the idea of the uh, quality assurance that we applied in this program and uh, the need for a high level of rigor, that was um, uh, that's shown here uh, in this view graph. But the main thing about uh, this type of a process is that we had to come up with procedures, uh, methodology, and documentation, and it was externally audited uh, by uh, Idaho National Lab, who has a very good uh, NQA1 program. DOE asked them to audit our processes here to make sure the uh, work we were doing uh, would meet NQA1 requirements. And that required regular uh, uh, audits 
of our facility and the data and our methods. And I thought I was very happy with the way that came out and it gave the, the laboratories a good way to work together in, in, in meeting the quality assurance requirements for this program. So I just wanted to say, reiterate that was a good process and I really enjoyed the engagement on that. And to do that, it takes a really small and dedicated uh, team of individuals that are really focused on documentation and quality assurance and uh, that was developed as part of the program. So that's a little bit of the background. Now I want to turn to what I would consider a little bit more a fun portion of the presentation, I'm talking about the facility itself, itself uh, some of the results that we obtained and some of the lessons we learned in terms of how this system might be deployed in at a full scale on a plant design. And this, uh, uh, you're looking at now is a facility overview on the left and the third is the or to the right is a 3D rendering of it. There's a little person down there to give you an idea of the scale of the facility. But basically, the if I can use the pointer here, if you can follow me, there was an air inlet uh, system that was drawn from the high bay air where this was deployed, an inlet plenum uh, that uniformly dis, uh, distributed uh, air inlet to the, the tubes here that I'm showing, which replicated at, in cross section at full scale, the design of the GA MHDGR, and vertically it was half scale. Uh, similar to the reactor, there was a, a collection plenum. Uh, there were two different flow paths that we provided for that, and these pipes basically discharged out to the atmosphere. The uh, overall scale of this facility is about 26 meters tall, and again, that's roughly about half scale. These two uh, types here were about half scale and the overall vertical, vertical elevation of the facility is about half scale also. So that's roughly where it's at. Moving forward, this gives you a, a picture of what the uh, facility looks like itself. That's Art Vick, he's one of the test engineers. The, uh, you're looking at the right side here, there was a, a large, uh, approximately seven meter long heated system here that replicated the exterior of the reactor vessel. I'm showing that here. On the uh, other side, this re replicates the interior uh, wall of the reactor silo itself, and that was treated as an adiabatic boundary condition in the facility. And uh, that gave us the uh, method methodology we needed uh, to, to be able to simulate quite a bit of transients in this system uh, over the course of several years as we did the testing. Uh, one of the, as I pointed out, we really focused a lot on putting a lot of instruments in this uh, facility to be able to map the thermal response uh, and detect uh, variations in conditions that we thought were important. And one of the most important things that we ended up doing in terms of uh, running these tests that we did know at the on onset is that we put a little weather condition station outside that uh, measured obviously air, the air temperature exterior to the building, the, the wind direction, uh, velocity, and relative humidity. So these are the conditions we monitor outside the building. And looking back, we found that weather had quite a bit of an uh, uh, influence on how the system operated, and I'll say a little bit more about that as we move forward. We also wanted to use uh, carbon steel that's typical of uh, what could be used in a lot of plants. The SAE 1020 low carbon steel we used here was, I think, replicative uh, representative of what they were using in the, the GE design at the time uh, for the prism reactor and we kept that as a part of this work and this shows basically the uh, thermal couples that were used to monitor surface temperatures in the plate just to give you an idea of what it looked like. Uh, with that done we assembled the facility and started uh, into a test matrix that was agreed upon with the sponsors before we started. Uh, clearly uh, we did some shakedown and calibration testing as we uh, started up to make sure things were working the way we thought they would. Uh, we did some baseline testing at steady state operating conditions to verify that the system would uh, keep the silo cool uh, under normal conditions uh, with forced convection flow and also to shake down our instruments and measure uh, losses at various points in the system which are very important to characterize for the analysis folks. Uh, we did the scaling verification testing, uh, looking at integral power effects and also uh, reduced physical scale if we heated upper and lower portions of the plate uh, system. And I'm not really saying too much about the heating system we have, but uh, it was banked 
and zone both vertically and radially so we could do power uh, cosine power shaping as we desire. We could do um, azimuthal power skewing to look at differences uh, when uh, tubing and cooling systems were like located in a corner. Uh, so there was quite a bit of flexibility and uh, that was looked at in terms of the testing, but I don't really have time today to get into that much. I'm going to try to just stay to the higher level uh, uh, topics that we're trying to cover. Uh, of course, we did performance testing looking at uh, different factors, and some of those included a single chimney configuration. Uh, we looked at forced convection flow, as I said, also uh, to get some thermal hydraulic data. We looked at situations that uh, designers are interested in. Uh, blocked riser channels was one of those where we looked at uh, blocking out half the ducts and verifying that the system would perform uh, correctly. We also did a, a lot of testing to uh, verify repeatability and to look at weather effects, uh, which in the Chicago area, that's not hard to do because temperatures range uh, radically depending on whether you're in doing conditions in the summer or the winter. So we took full advantage of that in doing the testing that was performed as a part of this program. The other thing that wasn't noted here, which I thought was very uh, notable, is that we did a test where we looked at ingress, uh, instantaneous ingress of a large uh, volume of heavy um, gas, which in this case we used argon. And that was done to look at a situation in case you had the plant co-located with some kind of a chemical industry plant that you were supplying power to. And if there was some situation where there was a discharge from that plant that was fed into the uh, inlet to the cooling system, if that would impact the uh, operational uh, aspects. And we found that it did, but it was a short-term effect. And after uh, a matter of minutes, the system was able to recover and it reestablished normal flow. So those are the kind of things that we looked at in the program. And moving forward here, okay, now I want to do a little, just to discuss some of the uh, high-level tests that we had done and uh, some of the results and indications that were provided. And the first line, first objective was to do baseline testing conditions. And this is a large test facility, uh, dozens, hundreds of uh, upward, upwards of 100 square meters of surface area, so you're going to have some parasitic heat losses. We had a target uh, scaled power level that we wanted to operate at for the experiments, and the first thing we did was find out what our parasitic losses, so that after uh, we knew that, we could adjust the input power accordingly to get to the target net input power that we desired. Uh, and this is a large test facility. You can see that it took of the order of a day uh, at the initial uh, heating level to come up to uh, power. We were able to characterize our uh, parasitic heat losses incremental and thereby incrementally increase that and get up to our target power for the transient. Uh, again, that could take up to 10 hours uh, to stabilize at that level. And at that point, you would be able to uh, look at transient effects as we're done here, simulating decay heat after scram. So just to give you an idea, we took a lot of time to do this. Uh, looking at repeatability, this is looking at different uh, times of the year, uh, hot versus cold conditions, and you can see that uh, depending on the weather, you, you can get some influences, but basically the results are uh, repeatable, so within uh, pretty tight tolerance in terms of uh, what you can get to depending on uh, different tests and different weather conditions outside. And uh, uh, so we were happy with this, that we were able to show the repeatability uh, the heating process and uh, move forward with the testing. Uh, so this uh, next thing you have to do is, is define what the transient is you're going to look at, and this shows the scaled uh, GA MHTGR accident scenario that we investigated quite a bit. As I pointed out, this is a um, depressurized, conduction limited, cool down transient where at time zero uh, you develop a leak in the system and basically discharge your coolant, and after that limited by conduction and convection through the system uh, that is driving uh, the heat transfer to your reactor cavity cooling system. And in this analysis they had done the peak load on the exterior of the reactor vessel predicted to be reached at about um, 90 hours into the transient. Uh, by the time that was conducted and convected out to the uh, boundary of the reactor, they were predicting a peak temperature in the reactor cavity or on the exterior of the reactor cavity 
of about 100, uh, 440 degrees C after about 120 hours. So this is a driving function that uh, we wanted to simulate for the uh, um, uh, transient and uh, the, the experimenters who I'll say more about at the end in, in terms of the acknowledgement. Uh, program this up in the digital control system for the um, facility and basically ran this transient uh, to look at the effects. And then the next view graph shows what are, well, what are the results. And the, there's basically four view graphs here that I just want to say a few things about in terms of the results. This upper left view graph shows the collection of thermocouples located on the uh, heater plates that, that simulated the exterior of the reactor vessel that I showed the view graph of uh, earlier. This is basically just a, what, what we call a horse tail plot. It shows all the data, but you will see that the peak temperature, uh, based on the scale testing that was done, is quite actually, it's very, quite close, uh, about 440 degrees to what was predicted by the designers for this system a number of years ago, and that was actually occurring in about 120 hours. Uh, as they had predicted. Actually, it might have occurred a little earlier, but you can see uh, after about 100 hours, you're basically uh, stabilizing at about what the designers thought the system would evolve to. The other, this lower graph shows the uh, inlet, uh, inlet and exit temperatures on the air cooling ducts that were dumping air. Uh, this shows the upper right view graph shows the evolution of the uh, flow rate in terms of, I think this is in Sorry, I can't read it, but I think it's a kilograms per minute of the air transported through the reactor cavity cooling system here. Uh, you can see some uh, bumps and wiggles here, and this, these are basically due to, due to atmospheric effects uh, influencing. Th these are probably higher wind conditions here. Uh, and also provided in the reports are the meteor meteorological data that can be used to correlate this. But, but this basically shows how the system responds in a scale test at large scale uh, during a, a design basis accident for the GA MHDGR. The lower right view graph shows some of the temperatures uh, distributions on the riser ducts. And this data is important uh, not only from the viewpoint of the uh, thermal hydraulics design, but also from predicting uh, mechanical stresses in the system that the, um, the designers need to account for in terms of re reinforcing the duct work to be able to tolerate the thermal stresses that would be uh, placed on the system during an accident. And the one thing I will say is that this was uh, a design basis accident. I think uh, service level C and it, it rides out the um, uh, um, accident within the bounds for that. And if you're able to reestablish a flow within, I, I can't remember the uh, time, but I, at a service level that this was put at, there are a thousand hours or so you have to uh, Re regain and cool the reactor vessel, and on that basis, you would be able to restart the reactor uh, if it wrote out one of these events. So that's, I think this is very good data, and it's just trying to provide some of the in insights we got on that in terms of the uh, operational aspect. This, the next thing we looked at was winter uh, weather, uh, or, or weather effects, and uh, these view graphs show the uh, tr uh, tr uh, system response under uh, the same uh, type of an accident sequence, basically looking at red would be hot weather conditions and blue would be cold. Uh, the first thing you note is that the uh, uh, heater plate temperatures are very close uh, for either case, but there is a di difference in the mass flow rate that develops under cold versus hot conditions. And under colder conditions, you find a higher mass flow rate, and that's due to the, uh, the behavior after looking at the results, this was uh, deduced to be de deduced to be a result of the effect of natural convection, which is uh, better uh, for an ideal gas at lower temperature because the derivative of the density of the coolant with respect to temperature is higher at lower temperatures. So that was uh, eventually concluded to be why these results uh, were a little different in one aspect. Uh, that basically, the, the riser gas temperatures are offset based on what hot versus cold. And the uh, colder uh, temperatures kept the, the duct wall uh, cooler uh, than at hotter, hotter weather conditions, as you might uh, forget. But overall, the bottom line is, is that on the effect on the, the uh, 
react, reactor vessel peak temperature is not that great. And one of the other contributors to that is that radiation heat transfer is the dominant uh, mode of heat transfer in this type of scenario. Uh, roughly uh, two thirds to three quarters radiation versus a, uh, a third to a quarter uh, convection. So the effect on the uh, surface temperature of the plate is not that uh, pronounced in the result. So this is giving you an idea of the weather conditions. Uh, still favorable cooling behavior, but shifts in the temperature on the, the system uh, plumbing, if you want, if you will. The, another thing we did was look at uh, the effect of an adjacent chimney configuration and in some of the design aspects, the uh, inlet and exhaust um, uh, ducts were uh, pretty close together, so we did testing to look at that. And if you look over here at the left view graph, this gives you an idea of how we set the system up to do it. The blue line shows the inlet uh, that was used to the uh, RCCS, and basically we closed about here. I uh, ran some duct work down to the inlet uh, of the system and uh, I used that as the inlet and then we discharged through the normal um, uh, pathway for the, for, the, for the apparatus. And what we found here uh, in this test, and I'll go through that, is that we found quite a bit of effect here, um, and this was also weather dependent, but uh, during the startup, you know, you're starting up your plan, if, this is your configuration, you have to keep this in mind because uh, we showed a difficulty in establishing normal flow conditions here. And the blue is the inlet, uh, which is drawn from the high bay. And you can see uh, red is the exit uh, temperature from the system. And you can see that uh, there is interplay between these two as we start up and some oscillatory behavior where the hot, hot exhaust gas is drawn into the inlet and that causes some um, rapid fluctuations in the heat up transient. And uh, as we move forward, eventually this, uh, we just couldn't get our hands on this uh, during this part of the uh, operation. So we eventually started the, uh, the cooling fans and shut this test down uh, because we couldn't get it started up right. So it shows the, the indication that uh, in this kind of a system, you have to be uh, knowledgeable of it when you start up the reactor uh, for the first time. But I will say that once the system was running, it was very robust with respect to uh, in inlet and exit conditions. But uh, during startup, we did have some transients there. And the re some further analysis investigation indicated that this was principally due to the fact that the way the system was set up in the uh, this right uh, schematic shows the system we're looking here. And we found that when we had quite a bit of flow loss on the inlet to this system, before we got to the cooling uh, aspects of it, heating and cooling, that could cause some instability and interplay here. Uh, whereas when we did the condition where there was very little flow inlet loss, this system would start up a lot more stably. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, in terms of starting up the plane initially. That was one of our interesting findings that I thought uh, was revealed. Uh, so completion of the air testing. I'm trying to uh, stay at about an hour here, so uh, move along a little uh, quicker here. But we, I just want to say that we completed the air testing in uh, July 2016. This was documented in open literature reports that anybody on the line can find and use in their work. Um, we had formal audits that included uh, not only DOE uh, under the auspices of INL acting as the auditor. Uh, NRC was also a part of this process, so they came to our meetings and reviewed our data and uh, concluded, gave us uh, assurance that, uh, that it was about, uh, could be, it was meeting what they thought would be needed uh, to be used in a licensing application. Also, uh, we had, in, uh, this is Ariba, but I think it's Framathon now, and also GA, the uh, uh, designer for the MHTGR were involved, and also the heavy influence of the universities and the work we had done. This was all work, the results were scrubbed and concluded to be meeting the program objectives that were at a high level laid out in 2005. We started on rebuilding the facility. We laid out detailed uh, experimental objectives in 2013 and concluded testing in 2016. So the uh, testing involved about 2,300 hours of active heating. Uh, we conducted 27 tests, 16 of which we concluded met the uh, full QA requirements for the experiment. So that 
quite a large database out there examining accident scenario, uh, physical effects like block risers, uh, different skewing in, in the heating patterns, adjacent chimneys, meteorological effects, and other factors were looked at in terms of this. So it's a lot of data there to support this design, and we were very happy with the way the program came out uh, from a technical viewpoint. That said, um, uh, just high-level conclusions on the air test, ambient temperature. Um, again, reiterating the point that while the hot heat removal performance remains largely unaffected, uh, there are flow rate and absolute temperature variations uh, can vary dramatically uh, during the operation, but you retain, maintain robust heat removal. Uh, meteorological perturbations, as I said, there was sensitivity to the weather. Uh, and I think putting the weather station out there was one of the best things we had done for this program. As I noted at the beginning, the idea was to provide a uh, facility to look at design alternatives. And what you see here are some anti-drop uh, cowls that were designed uh, based on the results that we had, saw, we had seen originally. We had just basically cover caps for the uh, discharge lines. Uh, but Darius had some good ideas how we could uh, design, redesign a passive uh, caps that could be used to um, mitigate some of these weather effects, and these were designed, built, installed, put on, and shown to be uh, a valuable asset in terms of uh, perturbing or um, reducing some of those effects. Uh, power sensitivity and low power startup, I talked about that quite a bit, you saw that, but after you get the system up and running, uh, the system runs very well. Uh, block risers, uh, blocking every other uh, tube, uh, and the system was found to really have no large effect, and the system still ran fine. The reason every other tube was blocked in the design was that the uh, inlet and exit headers were uh, basically paired off one to the other, so that if one system was blocked in the reactor, you would still have cooling. So that's why that test was done in that manner, and it showed that there was really no effect on the uh, overall performance of the system. So that was a good piece of engineering information to get out of the, the uh, testing. So with that said, um, we completed this program. Uh, DOE put a lot of money in the, to support the designing and uh, fabrication of the facility. You never know what's going to be coming down the pike, so uh, there was a concerted effort to carefully take this facility uh, apart, document it, how it was done, and put it in safe storage so that if we needed to use it again in the future, we would have all the parts. So that's not uh, so much to do with the technical results, but just saying that you never know what's coming down the pike in terms of reactor designs, and so we carefully disassembled this and stored the equipment in a safe configuration such that it could be brought out and used in the future if needed. With that said, uh, we, we're now in the, well along in the stages of moving into the air to the water conversion. Uh, as I noted at the beginning, you have the air-based system, which uh, we now feel like we have good data on at least for one system to val validate the concept and the codes. There are also water-based systems, and the particular one that we are looking at is a Framatone 625-megawatt uh, thermal uh, design that uses the water uh, cooling system. And uh, basically, uh, DOE sponsored us to look at this do trace studies, thermal analysis, and calculations to design the system that would be used to convert from this air-based system that I'm showing in a vertical or horizontal cross-section here and moving over to a water-based system where these are basically water-cooled uh, uh, pipes that are uh, stitched together by uh, steel plating and the reactor vessel would radiate and convect to this system here. Uh, by conduction, you would transfer heat into the water, which would rise to the system here, and, and the reactor cavity wall, uh, exterior, or the reactor silo wall behind it would be kept uh, intact by, uh, at a low temperature by virtue of this. I will say this is a system that's commonly used in uh, carbon, carbon high-temperature carbon plants in the U.S., both gold, uh, coal and natural gas, and, but the idea was here to apply it in terms of a, a, a nuclear a system to qualify it for that type of a, a configuration. And the water test section design is shown here, and again, I'm just reiterating the fact that uh, we're using water, uh, stainless steel here um, for the water riser tubes. 
that are welded to uh, carbon fins that uh, would uh, be the, the basis for receiving the radiation heat transfer and conducting it to the water. As I said, the fins are made of 10A18 carbon. We use carbon steel here because it has a high emissivity, which is good for the radiation heat transfer process. However, uh, in reactor systems, water chemistry or water, you want to keep the water clean, obviously. And the stainless steel use here provides the ability to keep the water clean while maintaining the good heat transfer processes that uh, the carbon steel can provide in terms of the radiation heat transfer. This is the overall system design for the uh, inlet uh, instrumentation here. I'll say a little bit more and an exit. This is shown obviously laying sideways. Might say, what does that look like in reality? Here is the uh, water panel. This was manufactured by uh, Chicago uh, Bridge and Iron uh, out in um, North Carolina. They make they have facilities for making these types of uh, devices here. Again, you see the stainless steel tube, uh, the carbon panels. Uh, this was uh, sandblasted before we put it in, so we would go to, into the testing with a well-characterized surface emissivity mo moving forward. This shows the rigging getting ready, uh, vertically standing. These are Tony Tafoya, I believe, and uh, Darius Lukowski, he's the PI on the project. Uh, this shows the system that uh, is moved as it's installed in the reactor cavity cooling system test facility. This is I'm sort of making up in this you graph for the lack of one of these for the air system, but a very high uh, concentration of instrumentation in this facility uh, to not only characterize the thermal performance, but also to provide high fidelity data for the analysts. And one thing I didn't really say a lot about, but we're using a lot of fiber optic ten, uh, temperature sensing in this facility that gives you very high density temperature measurements across these heating panels. Uh, and this is good for the analysts. Uh, we also have a focus on two-phase flow in this uh, facility. Uh, when you go into the um, boiling heat portion of it, there are a lot of flashing effects here as you move up to the header tank, and this can influence some of the heat transfer processes. So we have devices in here for measuring two-phase uh, void behavior uh, during these transients, which are uh, quite a bit more exciting than the air-based tests. I will say uh, the sys system rock and rolls a little bit when the boiling starts. And this header tank, it's about a 4,000-liter tank that's located up very high in the high bay. So we did a lot of work to show that the, um, uh, the, the um, scaffolding that was on it could adequately take this in terms of the vibrations and the loads during the test. So a lot of engineering went into this uh, uh, facility that I don't really have the time to talk about today. So where are we at on that? This, this uh, air, the, the water-based facility has been completely installed. Um, everything's been uh, put together. Some shakedown testing has been done to verify the instrumentation. Uh, works accordingly, and we've qualified uh, the facility and done the single phase demonstration test uh, that was basically looking at normal operation of this facility with the uh, pump running and the heat exchanger dumping uh, um, heat from the uh, header tank uh, during normal operation. Um, first accepted matrix test at single phase was done in January 2019 to look at normal, normal operation, as I had said. And uh, by August of uh, this year, we had completed the uh, plan testing to look at single phase parametric effects in the facility. So quite a bit of progress made there. And I, uh, approximately a month ago now, the first two phase uh, boiling heat transfer accident scenario test was done uh, to show that the test worked in that regard. And that test was quite successful. <coughs> Excuse me. This uh, view graph is a little bit on the boring side, but it's just showing the overall uh, uh, planning and uh, moving forward with this facility design here in terms of the work, the, the uh, construction, fabrication, checkout, uh, and basically we just completed the parametric uh, single phase studies test. We're in a period of maintenance now, and we're uh, uh, engaging on the accident uh, testing uh, as I described earlier. So. Uh, the next uh, couple of years, we'll complete the test matrix and document these results as was done for the air-based testing. And with that, that step completed, we would have um, done an in, a high quality level look at a, a large scale 
uh, air-based system and a large-scale water-based reactor cavity cooling system that support a re um, advanced reactor designs that might want to employ this kind of a concept. And I'm a firm believer in it that um, at the scales of these reactors that you could deploy these systems and feel confident that even under um, accident scenarios they would um, be able to dissipate decay heat without uh, operator intervention and get the job done and preserve the core, restart the reactor without fuel damage and uh, preserve the investment in the facility. So I think this has been a good series of tests and I'm really looking forward to this series of experiments moving forward. And finally, I, this is uh, possibly the most important view graph that I, I want to say that the Department of Energy has uh, supported this work. I, we're very grateful to that. We're firm believers in this kind of work supporting advanced reactor concepts moving order forward and they've been very uh, dutiful about making sure we have the resources to do this work right. As I also said, we have a lot of uh, university engagement and I want to thank uh, the universities that have been involved. Uh, the facility's been good in terms of uh, allowing us to uh, support students to work on the project and get them some experience so they will be valuable assets to the industry moving forward. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Darius Lasowski here. Not only, he's the principal investigator on this um, project. First, I want to say thank you to him for helping me out immensely on these view graphs because they wouldn't have been nearly as high quality without his input. But secondly, he's done a great job of uh, taking this facility by the horns, running it, meeting all the uh, requirements for it, and I'm very grateful that, that they help. And he's been able to provide it as well as all the folks, the engineers and uh, designers that have worked on this program hard. And also, I want to give a shout out to the uh, analysts who have done work to uh, support with uh, RELAP and the CFD codes, the, the work that's been done, and they've provided valuable insights in how we should run the facility and where we should put uh, instrumentation. So I believe that ends my formal presentation, unless there's anything else. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Farmer. If you have questions, I know several have come in during the presentation, but please do take a minute to type your questions into the Q&A pod and we'll take those questions in just a minute. Um, while we're waiting for those, we'll take a quick look at the upcoming webinar presentations um, that we have planned. Next month, we have a presentation on the Czech Experimental Program on MSR Technology Development by Dr. Uller. In December, uh, Madeline Feltes with DOE will present on Trezo fuels. And in January of 2020, we'll have thermal hydraulics and liquid metal fast reactors by Dr. Gernschfield. If you'll bear with me a minute, I will open up. Um, so much you should be able to see the queue, the questions as well. Um, on your questions panel, there are several here, and I'll just start with um, near the top. There's a question. Oops, there's a question that says, "Can we regard the system with shape memory alloy actuator as a fully passive system? It doesn't require AC or DC power, but it has a moving part for actuation." And then what I think I'll do is just answer that with a, um, I'm going to post it so everyone can read it. Do you see it now? I don't, Berta, but um, I may not be doing something right here. Could you read that question one more time, please? Yeah. Um, can we regard the system with shape memory alloy actuator as a fully passive system? It doesn't require AC or DC power, but it has a moving part or for actuation. Well, I'm, I'm going to be frank. I'm not familiar with that system, um, but if it is based on the concept of uh, thermal expansion to activate, and that's a well-known um, um, system that's that's based on basic common sense physics, so I, I would think that it would be. 
Um, you would have, of course, do the testing to verify that it is repeatable and uh, it, it works as planned, but I'm frankly not familiar with that system. The next question, RCCS is a concept for boiling water reactors. It is not even for PWR. How to consider it in Gen 4? Should we understand it as extra core cooling? I, I would say uh, definitely the, the system that we have looked at are based on looking at um, high temperature gas reactor designs. Uh, that was the specific one we looked at uh, in terms of the air and water based testing. Uh, the, the thing about these uh, passive uh, systems is that at least in terms of the high temperature gas reactor, there's a scaling limitation on how big the reactor can be made because you limit um, basically relying on conduction heat transfer from the fuel out through the reflector and moving out that way. So that, that places a, a size limitation on how big this system would work. Um, it, would, it, it will definitely work. Uh, I, I think we've shown that, that uh, for gas reactor designs, it has also been shown in a different derivative design concept to be applicable for um, the sodium uh, reactor design, and that would be the GE prism design. Uh, there were testing that done that was shown there. I think this system could also be used uh, possibly for uh, sodium systems, although uh, there would be uh, differences on the boundary conditions that would be applied, and I haven't really looked at that, and that affected for the air system that we looked at. Uh, and the water system, you know, could be used for other concepts, uh, also depending on the coolant type and the compatibility with um, that system. So yes, I think it definitely applies to advanced reactor systems also. And and I believe the uh, passive the, uh, the point about the um, natural convection uh, concept would be for the I think the uh, GE EB, EBWR where they use uh, basically a pump free circulation uh, boiling driven uh, heat transfer system also that's used as the primary method for rejection of heat. So I don't know if that was helpful, but I tried to answer the question. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Someone did point out that the lower portion of the slides were being cut off, and I was trying to fix that on this end while it was going on. Um, I hope that I was able to resolve that. If not, I, I do apologize, and I will definitely take that feedback to make sure that the slides <clears throat> in future presentations do not come down that close on the margin. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I, I, I apologize. On my end, they showed, um, so I don't know if it's my screen, I don't know. I hope it got better as we went along. Um, when it is run by air, how to make sure no water goes into the loop? Does that make sense? Uh, repeat, repeat that, please, Berta. When it is run by air, how to make sure no water goes into the loop? Well, that's a good question, and it's basically accommodated by the, um, uh, the, the chimney caps that were shown in the drawing there, those are uh, designed to keep water from being, uh, you know, air to be able to convect around and also to keep water out from weather effects. Um, if you go into the details of the uh, plant design, uh, that we didn't really get into any of that, but they have engineering features in there, uh, I believe, to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, even if there's water in there that it's not, you know, influencing the behavior and it's captured. So uh, the, the, basically the way you do that is by carefully designing the caps on the air supply and return uh, lines and then having engineering features in there, even in the event that some water came in that it would uh, not be impactful. And this system is also fully welded together. So it's, it's a robust structure. It's uh, not a sheet metal configuration, if that makes sense. Would water cooling increase cost and reduce plant location versatility? I, I think uh, water cooling um, is attractive from the viewpoint. It has an attractive feature in that it decouples you from the weather, and it also provides a specified specific uh, boundary condition for um, uh, dissipating uh, heat, and that's the boiling point of the water. So. 
Uh, the attributes of that are that it fixes the, the de somewhat decouples you from uh, the, the weather conditions because you're relying on natural convection within the loop and boiling heat transfer versus coupling to the atmospheric conditions. The nice thing about the air system is it's relatively simple. Uh, I think it reduces the possibly the maintenance uh, requirements that uh, a water system carries with it. Uh, so there are benefits and uh, to both systems, but I at least from uh, I think that increasing the uh, decoupling from weather locations, the water system is nice because it relies on boiling. With the, passive, with the passive approach to the heat removal, will there be a need for accident tolerant fuel? Well, I think triso. I, the, I, I, it's always better to have accident tolerant fuel under any regard. I, any the better, more robust you can make the fuel, the better. I think the triso fuel that uh, is used in the HTGR design is probably the most accident tolerant fuel you will ever uh, come up with. It depends for the other reactors. Um, in the uh, moving forward, uh, the question is, uh, de depending on your accident scenarios and where you're getting, uh, the, whether or not you decide to use accident tolerant fuel is, is uh, up to the designers. And uh, but it's always better to make the fuel robust, more robust under any condition relative to postulated accident sequences. So I think for the the HTGRs, I think the triso fuel is the most accident tolerant fuel I've ever seen. And I think that's already part of the uh, gas reactor uh, folks uh, moving forward on that. The um, other, the idea with the system, though, is that it's specifically targeted to keep you away from uh, getting to temperatures within the fuel that could damage it. Uh, so accident tolerant fuel is always better, uh, but the specifics of this design are to actually prevent that. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Do you have an estimate of cost to backfit this system on existing nuclear power plants? No idea. I, we're, we're a research organization and uh, we're doing um, uh, work to verify that it, it works according to plan and that it can be done. I, the, I don't know of any plans to backfit these types of systems into existing plants. As, as far as I understand it, these systems would be deployed in um, new, new plants moving forward, so put it in from the ground up, so really it's just part of the uh, plant cost moving forward. I have no idea, uh, and you know, you have to, have, I, I don't even know if it would be possible to backfit this into uh, some plants. Thank you. Is there a reason why for the water assisted design tubes are used instead of having water directly contacting the reactor guard vessel wall? Well, um, for high temperature uh, gas reactor designs, I think that would probably that would probably overcool the system and uh, the, the HTGRs that I know you're trying to run the system at higher temperature to get the higher gas temperatures to um, uh, get better efficiency uh, in the system. And if you had water on the uh, reactor vessel, that would, in my opinion, be too much heat sink, and it would limit your peak temperatures you could achieve. And it would also, it would probably also, if you tried to press the uh, core temperatures up to higher level, it would probably place a great deal of thermal stress on on the RPV itself. So I don't even know for a high temperature system if that would be plausible from a mechanical design viewpoint based on the thermal stresses it would place on the system. So that's one clear advantage point of just lining the, the um, silo with a, a cavity cooling system that can operate and dissipate the decay heat that you need while allowing the reactor vessel and the reactor system itself to operate the way it's intended to. You mentioned at some point that parasitic decay heat removal systems have been considered. Is this common in the design of these systems? Well, it's, um, it's, it's been common in the, the plants that 
have been under consideration in the U.S. for a long time. Uh, as I pointed out, these reactor cavity cooling systems are, are not new. Uh, they've been around for years. Uh, and in the, the GE uh, PRISM design and the GA MSTGR designs, these have been there from the get-go uh, on those. And then in the Framatone design, I know it's been in there for a while. So these, these concepts are, are not new. The idea with the work that we were doing was to take them and to perform testing on them to, to verify that they would operate according to plan and to provide the information needed to get them licensed uh, with the NRC. So that was the intent of our work. Thank you. Um. How do you avoid corrosion in the water cooling tubes of RCCS? Well, that's uh, accomplished by using um, stainless steel tubes, uh, which are, you know they use stainless, is a, which is a common um, uh, water plumbing material used in nuclear power plants and, and you know heat transfer systems in general. So it's accomplished by using stainless steel uh, to prevent corrosion. And the um, carbon fins that were in the um, design were welded to those. And you can weld carbon to stainless if you, if you know what you're doing. And they've been doing it a while at um, Chicago Bridge and Iron. But um, So that's how it's accomplished, by using stainless steel as the container for the water system itself. And then, obviously, you would have a water uh, purification and monitor monitoring system that would run as the plant operated uh, to be able to control water chemistry and prevent corrosion. So, that, I mean, that would be the way to do that. And I, that, I think that's fully implemented in the design for, for the con conceptual design for the plant. Thank you. Did you consider emissivity of the RPV plate as a constant value not dependent on temperature? Normally the value is taken around 0 0.5, at least for sodium cooled fast reactor vessels. That, we, we did no online monitoring of the emissivity of the plate. What we did do is that we have instruments uh, that looked at uh, emissivity uh, at, at, the at the start of the test program and at the end of the test program. And I think that data is readily available in the data, that, uh, uh, data reports for the program. Uh, so that was clearly one of the key things we wanted to measure. And it was done at um, several points during the program. and I. That information is available in the reports. If not, you can't find it. We can get it to you, but I'm sure that it's in there because that's a critical parameter. We did not measure it online, though, uh, as that would be uh, too difficult for us to do. Great. Is there a reason why, for the water-assisted design, tubes are used instead of having water directly contacting the reactor guard vessel wall? You already answered that one. Didn't we do that one yeah, already? Yeah. That's what I thought, too. Which point do you see as challenging to capture numerically, and by so, which justify experimental investigation rather than a numerical assessment? I'm not sure I'm going to understand that one. Well, I, I think, um, well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a good, good point, and the, the, that was one of the principal drivers for this program, and it was identified early in the N next generation nuclear power plant or NGNP program. Uh, when that was uh, moving forward in the early 2000s. And that, the idea was that we were, you never know what people are going to bring in by way of a design that they want to get licensed. So the idea was that we would look at a couple of designs in detail. We would uh, take the uh, tools, the numerical tools that we had, and we would qualify those against these tests and show that they worked and they worked repeatedly. And then those tools would be available to, to numerically analyze and show the safety attributes of designs as they move forward. And um, I, I, from our, um, I think we, we have been uh, successful at that in terms of the air testing. We're moving forward in the water. And that's a good question. I think what we have shown, at least in the air-based testing, is that if you have good numerical models of the system, uh, that, the, that the codes do pretty darn well uh, in terms of being able to predict the behavior. I think in terms of the uh, individual physics processes of, 
of a natural convection and radiation heat transfer to the system. I think that has um, been shown to be calculatable and repeatable. Uh, some of the things you get into, though, are more at the system level analysis, being able to model the whole plumbing through the system and look at weather effects. So those are some of the more nu numerical challenges from a, a plant system level um, approach, uh, but the idea was generally to show that these codes work when they look at water and air-based systems and then you have some confidence that when you apply those to other systems as they are developed that you're being able to predict reality. Thank you. I'm scrolling down, there's a long one. Um, is natural circulation of air only and then parenthetical, no water. Is natural circulation of air only, no water, sufficient to remove decay heat of an MSR size concept? Is there a max rated power whose decay heat can be removed with air only? That's an excellent question. And the answer to that is yes. And the, the further the answer depends on um, the reactor design and the cavity cooling design and uh, I've heard, you know, I, there's, I guess, um, I, I'm not actually able to answer that in detail, but the answer is definitely yes. There was a report done uh, by INL in 2012 that looked at the uh, reactor cavity cooling system design for HTGRs that you can find online if you're willing to look at that uh, in terms of the a plant response under postulated transients. So that has been done. It's been done numerically. I know there was also some work done for sodium cooled fast reactors. There, um, and you're, you're definitely right. This is limits the plant size and you know to, to several hundreds to uh, maybe a thousand uh, megawatts thermal. Uh, don't take those as actual values. You have to do your homework and your own analysis to show it. Uh, but you're exactly right. This system itself uh, is li limits is limited. Uh, into the size that it can be used for in terms of accident, um, um, mid, um, the, the effects that heat up of the system. Thank you. Great questions today. Very good questions. I think we've worked through um, the, the bulk of the questions that we've received. Um, we may have time for one more if we have any, any other thoughts out there. But I do want to, I want to take this opportunity to thank you again, Dr. Farmer, for your um, participation and putting this webinar together. It's, it's great information, and I know it does take a bit of time to do that, and I appreciate it. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. I mean, this, this is important information, and I, it is important to the reactor safety community, and people should be knowledgeable of it, and we're here to help, help the process along. I mean, that's what we need to do. Uh, I, mean, I think these are really important systems for the next generation of um, uh, plants moving forward, and I, they can do a lot to mitigate scenarios that you don't know about and uh, keep the investment intact and not in the, in the fission products where they're supposed to be. So I, I really am a firm believer of this kind of process. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Mitch, again. Thank you, no Bessa. Problem. Great, great presentation and great uh, turn around with the questions. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.